Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My Yowie sightings are why I research the Yowie. My name's Yowie Dan, and I'm a researcher of the Australian Yowie in Australia. It all happened way back in 2005. That's when it started for me. It's been a long journey, but a very enjoyable one. And the first sighting I will actually encounter was at a greyhound racing track because I used to race greyhounds. And this is a place called Appen, and it's about 70 kilometres south of Sydney. Anyway, I took my dog down. It was a cold morning in July, so it's winter time for us there in Australia. So basically, I take my dog down. I'm waiting for my turn to trial my greyhound, and it's a straight track, not a circle track. It's good for dogs that are young, learning how to run fast. They try to, They kind of trip over their legs. So I've got my young dog there, and I'm waiting down the bottom. It's 366 metres from the bottom where the boxes are to where the winning post is. Everyone else is about 270 metres away at the other boxes. So I'm there with my dog. I've never heard my dog bark. She was probably 18 months old, so I've just started trialling her. The dog turns around and is looking into the tea trees. Tea trees is like a thick, like small bush probably grows to like two meters tall but it's really thick can't see through it and then she starts barking frantically and her name was sally and i was like what's wrong sally what are you looking at so she's just barking frantically and then you know when you touch something like like at school at the in the science department and have that ball and electricity and you touch it and your hair all stands up like you're electrified that's how the dog's hair was it's like she was electrified but she was backing into me but put herself in between me and what was in the bush and i didn't know what was there And I thought if it was a small animal, she would try to chase it and then attack it. That's what they're bred to do. It's like 7.30 in the morning. It's cold. It's foggy. And within about 20 seconds of her barking, there was this massive, big, like, roar, like, I say for whatever expelled this noise out of its chest, had to have a chest the size of Andre the Giant, from the, the old wrestler from the 1980s and 1970s. This thing just... I can't get near the noise that it made. I, I just haven't got a chest that's big enough. Anyway, she, she's barking, frankly, and I'm just like, what's going on? Like, what is this? And there's nothing behind there. It was just thick bush. So it just starts shaking this big gum tree that's about, oh, the trunk would be about as round as a basketball. And it just shakes it. And you can hear the roots cracking in the ground. And they're big, thick roots for these, these gum trees. And gum trees' roots spread right out. So, and it's crack, crack, crack. And I'm just bewildered, just going, what's going on? What? I'm just freaking out. I don't know what's just within about five meters in the bush. The dog's still barking. I'm just frozen. And then the tree just gets like whatever was shaking it, just let it go. It leaned up against one of the other trees. Otherwise, it would have fell over. And then it ran through the bush and it was just bang, crash. Just like a bulldozer going through the bush, its feet, when it hit the ground, it was like the biggest sledgehammer hitting hard dirt that was really compacted. When it ran off, I just got a dog on the lead and I just took off back up to the other people and they've said, what's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost. And I went, I don't know, it wasn't a ghost, but look at that tree, nearly ripped it out of the ground. And they go, look at your dog. Looks, I'm just going, you should have been there. That was crazy. I don't know what it was. And so I still trolled the dog, but I walked down the track with the guy who starts the boxes because I was a bit freaked out. I jumped in the car, the dog ran up the straight, put her in the car after she had a drink of water and went home, got on the computer and looked up the Yowie. Basically, I didn't know what, what it was. To me, it's like a dream time story from the indigenous people, the Aboriginal people in here in Australia. I know in North America, they got stories about how things were created. It's the same 
thing here with the Aboriginals. All I thought is a Yowie chocolate. That's all I thought a Yowie was, was like a Dreamtime story or a chocolate. So after looking up on the internet and I come across the AYR, Australian Yowie Research, run by Dean Harrison, and he'd been doing the research since the 1990s. So this was 2005. So since 2005, I've been thinking, all right, I'm going to go out in the bush and I'm going to try and find what this thing was. Because I've always been interested in shows way back in the oh, 1970s. It was that In Search Of with uh, Leonard Nimoy. And I used to watch it every Sunday. And even to this day, I say to people, if you watch the Bigfoot episode, it's got the spookiest music on it. It'll freak you out. You don't want to watch it and then go out in the bush. You'll be scared. So anyway, I go out into the bush. I go to a place called Glenbrook in the Blue Mountains. It's about 70 kilometers west of Sydney. You get on the M4 and just follow it till you come to the Blue Mountains. It's basically like the first suburb you come to. And I just wanted to go to an easy trail. It's not too hard to go up and down because the Blue Mountains can have some really, yeah, it's trails that are really hard. They've got easy ones, but some of them are hard. Anyway, so I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, I didn't have any gear. I just went out and trying to find signs what people on the internet were saying what the Yowie yeah, could do, like tree breaks or wood knocks and footprints and, you know, just try to find something that didn't really look like a kangaroo or an, or an animal that was known to science. So I've gone out to Glenbrook and uh, one of the guys that had been researching for a while and he kind of took me under his wing and his name's David Reed. He's come a very good mate. He lives down in Canberra. It's the nation's capital. And he's about three hours south of me. He just said, you yeah, know, get some trail cameras and get some sound recorders. So I bought a trail camera. It was basically, I thought I'd be able to capture one on a trail camera, but no, it's just for me, putting them out now is just to see what food sources are around for a big animal to survive. So I put sound recorders out and I got a few really good sound recordings of something running around a 12 foot rock ledge. And it was about a three meter uh, drop to the creek. And then it dropped down into the creek. And then it was walking through the creek and you hear the water gurgling around its feet. And then it goes off into the bush to the other side where there's no trails. But this is all happening around the same time, July. What happened was uh, when it jumped off the rock ledge, it was a huge thud. So something with weight. It wasn't a person. It was something that was really heavy. And it wasn't a kangaroo because the kangaroo wouldn't, it couldn't walk through. It's got a hop and it wouldn't have that water gurgling around its feet like whatever walked through there. So I had mass about it. So I went back there and I actually had a, a old digital tape video recorder. I put it down next to this little tree that had been broken. I was just trying to show how hard it was to really break it, even though it was not a big tree. So while I'm trying to do that and I put the camera down, up in the back, unbeknown to me, there's a big black, well, I was, I'm pretty sure it was a Yowie because I don't know what's nearly 12 foot tall next to a rock ledge because... I've been there and I've got a three meter tape and it goes from the ground up to the top of that rock ledge. And it was probably a foot shorter than that. And you see it for about six frames in the video. I put it on my YouTube channel, which is called Australian Yowie. So that's where all my research goes to over the years. So then I've gone to do a, like a hike there again, because I did research the area for a, a long time because I was getting a lot of good results. I just happened to pick that area not for any reason other than it was just easy for me to get to. It was about 40-minute drive for me to get to, and I just happened to get there at the right time when they were hanging around that area. I believe that they do go from one area to another, like when the food is exhausted for them, then they move to another area and then just keep them maybe just doing a big circle. It might take a year or two, and then they come back to this area while they're going to other areas and exhausting the food resources one after the other. So I was walking along the trail, and I got about half or probably about, oh, I would say about 200 meters in. And then something started moving through the bush. And it was a really rainy, misty day. And then I heard like something on my left. But then I'd hear these indigenous language. But it was like it was overlapping. It was like it was trying to say two, two words at once. So when you try to say two words at once, it's just it's impossible. It's hard. But that's what it sounded like to me. But it sounded like little kids, like five, six, seven-year-old kids. I'm thinking, who's bringing out a bunch of kids and they're down in the creek and it's a cold day and it's foggy and raining? So anyway, I was a bit mystified, so I kept walking along and then I heard like the same kind of voices, the same language, but like 
uh, teenage girls. That's what it sounded like. And I was a bit puzzled, like, what's going on here? They know a local walked past because you, you know the locals they always walk with their dogs. And he was walked past with a dog. And I said, have you heard us say anything really weird? It's just I'm hearing these voices around. And the guy's looking at me like, hearing voices. And he must be needing any go anyway. He just goes, no, nah, I haven't heard anything. And then took off. So basically, I just kept walking. And whatever was in the bush kept paralleling me through the bush. So I've probably got about halfway to where I wanted to get to, which was where I filmed the big uh, 10-foot Yowie. When I'd stop, it'd stop. And then when I'd walk, it'd walk. And I'm thinking, this can't be a wallaby. And it's not a person because these bushes are really, if you walk through these bushes, they, they can scratch your legs, you know, and, and draw blood. So you don't go through these bushes. So I'm thinking, What's, what is this? So I'm trying to stop and have a look. I couldn't see it. And I got about, a, you're looking about 800 meters to a kilometer along the trail. And I look to my left and I'm thinking, oh, there's all these paper bark trees. Kind of the area is open so you can look in. So I'm looking in, and I thought I got there before it, but it actually got there and beat me. And so at this stage, I didn't know what it was. And I'm looking in, and I've got my camera, and I'm filming, but being pretty much a novice working a camera, I'm kind of overshooting because I'm looking up the ridge. So I'm over, I'm overshooting what I'm trying. You know, if I pan down half a foot to a foot, I would be right on it. But I, I didn't really do a good job. It would have been a really good piece of film. I would have pretty much gone out straight away and, f- and got one on camera. But unfortunate because I was a novice, I, you know, I stuffed it up. But anyway, I was looking into the bush and then it looked like insects had gone into a tree and it started bulging. That's what they do here. There's like borers and the, 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 the tree starts bulging out trying to, I think, fix itself up while these insects are doing their damage inside. But then it kind of just moved about an inch and then it blinked. And then once they did that, and it was about six meters into the bush. Once it did that, I started picking up features. I could only see like a head peering around this, the thickest tea tree that was there. You're probably looking at a bit, three quarters the thickness of a basketball. So this creature wasn't big. Everything about it was petite. It was like, you know, you see the midgets, but uh, probably the tallest midget out of the group. You got all different sizes, but it's about three, maybe three and a quarter foot high. It had either dark chocolate brown hair or black i wasn't sure because it was wet so you know when hair gets wet it gets darker so it could have been dark chocolate or a black and it was like oh, what could i say there was it was drizzling rain and there was fog i'm just trying to get as much information and take as much in as as possible while i'm seeing this pretty much creature for the first time and in my mind was like wow these things are real like until then even though i had the one uh the encounter at Appen where it shook the tree around and my dog was barking and I was freaking out. I didn't really believe still 100%. I was on the fence. Like I was trying to work out that could have been something else. But then here's one just looking me in the face. And it had dark hair, uh, had small lips, small nose. It was like that someone had a wide nose, but I had done plastic surgery done. The nose wasn't really that big. And then the hair went around its, like, around its jawline. There was no hair in the face. And the face was like a blue-gray color. And it had small ears, but the ears were darker. The ears weren't the same skin color. It's like the, the skin got darker from the face going to its ears. And that's all I saw of it because then it just got, like, the rain come in harder, the fog come in. It's a really foggy area up there at the Blue Mountains when it rains and then in winter. So it was gone. And I was standing there and I still play that video and some of the things I say, like, my heart's pumping. I'm like, oh, of course, your heart's pumping all the time. But I meant to say, yeah, you know, it's going really hard because I'm like, it's going crazy because I'm just thinking, I've seen something that should not be there. Science says this thing shouldn't be there, but here it is. I've seen it and I'm just scratching my head. So anyway, I've had some really good sound recordings in this area. I've actually found some handprints under a rock ledge in sand way off the trail. I went with another researcher at the time and we come across them we couldn't find any footprints around the area that anyone had been there just bush bashing and so that's the story of, of glenbrook and that was really what really ramped up my research where i thought i've got to get some better gear here and i've got to do the best i can at that time there was some people that were doing some research and they weren't showing anyone around the world that it was done properly they were like faking stuff and it was just making people in australia here look bad like we're just like a bunch of idiots that don't know what we're doing and we're just 
putting out their fake stuff and no one's going to believe us if we actually do say we've seen one for real. So that's why I made my YouTube channel to say, look, this this one person out here that's doing honest research. Now there's heaps of uh, Yowie uh, channels. So, but back then there wasn't many in 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 the, between 2005 and 2010. So I thought, all right, I'm going to get on AYR. I'm going to talk to the guys that have been out there for a while, and I want to find the areas that have got more sightings. They've got a history of something being there. So it's my chance of getting something. So I bought a tent, I bought a torch, and I bought a few things, uh, you know, all the things you need to go out camping, try and make my pack as light as I can, and I picked a few spots. And in one spot was, if you go to the Blue Mountains, one of the major areas to see is the Three Sisters. It's three columns on the end of a ridge, and it's an Indigenous story that, that, that these three sisters got turned into rock. And in that area, there's a Jamison Valley, and opposite that is... Uh, Mount Solitary, I've been camping up there, and on to your right is called Narrow Neck. It's like a big, could I say, headland that just goes out. It's like a big neck. Anyway, so I went into there with a friend, and I said, let's go camping up in between where the ruined castle is. It looks like a castle. There's all rocks there, and if you go up, and it looks like a couple of hundred-year-old castle that's just dilapidated, and, but it's actually a natural feature. So we'll go camping in between there and, uh, what could I call it, uh, Mount Solitary. So we got to the campsite. The reason why I went there with my uh, research partner at the time was I actually went there a month earlier with one of my twin sons, and he was about eleven or twelve at the time. And we'd actually we'd been watching a lot of the uh, documentaries coming out, and they always talk about bipedal walking. So my kids are always saying that sounds bipedal walking, and it was really funny. You know, they learn about that word bipedal. Anyway, so we're I'm in the tent just getting changed because I've carried all the gear. And my son's cooking marshmallows on the fire and he's going, Dad, Dad, there's something bipedally walking in the bush. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm thinking it's just a, a wallaby or a roo. Anyway, so I come out of the tent and I'm looking there and he goes, Dad, it's behind the bush. And I see this kind of black thing standing there behind the, these small bushes. And, and so I put the torch on it and it just shot down this ridge. And now I've been down this ridge. And there's heaps of those little bushes that just scratch you. Like you walk down with not long pants on your legs or gaiters, which is, helps to protect from snake bite because Australia's full of dangerous snakes. And there's no way it was a person. It wasn't a roo because I've seen it run on two legs and I'm thinking, gee, they're here. <laughs> I just started thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't have brought my son. So anyway, we uh, basically just had something to eat. And then we heard about 45 minutes later, it come down down the same little ridge and stood behind the trees again. And then this time I've walked up the trail and I've just got my thongs on, which is Australian for, I think, flip-flops in America. So I'm just walking with my thongs on. I didn't have boots. So I wanted to give my feet a rest. I've gone up the trail a bit and I've gone on a different angle and I've shone this torch on this thing. And then I'm just, it kind of looked at me and I'm like, wow, it is a Yeah, we're standing there. And it was just jet black. I don't remember any more features because it was really dark. When I put the torch, I, pretty much just got the bottom half it was just solid it was a solid creature about six foot tall and within a second it just shook the trees gave it a bit of a scream and just talk off in the bush so i thought i've got to come back here so that's why i went back there with a friend and while we were there we had something to eat and we're sitting around we could hear him at about 10 30 at night and they're paralleling and walking backwards and forwards either side of the ridge so we're on the top so you look to your right and your left and they're just going backwards and forwards like someone pacing up and down waiting for the wife to have have a baby, you know, just waiting for things to happen. So anyway, so we're just sitting there and he, he's freaking out a little bit. We haven't got any weapons. Look, I, I did have a big machete and he had like a truncheon uh, like the police use. Anyway, so that's all we had. We don't have guns in Australia. So we don't have any major big animals that can attack us like bears or cougars and that. So we're a bit lucky. We just got a lot of poisonous creatures like funnel web spider, which is the most dangerous spider in the world. And the brown snake, if you get bit by that where we were, uh, there was no way we were going to come out alive. So we got some dangerous creatures there, even though we don't have big predators. So he's freaking out a bit. They kind of settle down and we get pretty late at night where we said, look, we've got to lay down and have a bit of a sleep because it's got a it's a two and a half hour hike to get out. So it couldn't be any person playing a joke on us. So these creatures are walking backwards and forwards and it kind of settled down where they quietened down. 
Anyway, so we've gone to sleep probably 12.30 at night. And he said one ran in between our tents. He said it ran straight through from one side to the other. And he goes, didn't you hear that? I said, nah, nah. He goes, well, you were snoring at the time, so you wouldn't have heard it. A bit later on, I kind of moved in my tent. I've got a little one-man tent to make it as light as possible. Everything's got to be light, including my gear. You've got to carry on food and water. There's no creeks down there. Or if you're going to go to the creek, it's going to take you so much effort to get down there. You're pretty much going to drink the water by the time you get back up. So you've got to carry four or five liters of water. Anyway, so I'm kind of moving in my tent. And next minute, I can hear something just like buzzing through the air. like, And then it hits the tent. And the tent hits me in the face. And I'm thinking, son just threw something at my tent. And I was just awake enough to realize that. So I've got out of the tent and it's just foggy. You put the torch on, you couldn't hear anything because the light, uh, sorry, see anything because the light just reflects off the fog. So I'm walking around with this torch on trying to do as, look as much as I can, but the fog was that thick. I couldn't see a foot in front of me. And anyway, I didn't get my friend up. I just went back to bed and kind of stayed awake for a while. And uh, the next morning, I made a coffee, started a little fire, and he's, he gets, this is like 5.30 in the morning, all the birds go crazy there, and it's really quiet at night. You can only hear the odd owl making a noise, so if something's walking around the bush there, you can hear these footsteps pretty easy. People might say, ah, oh, it's just kangaroos. Well, I've never seen a kangaroo pace up and down, backwards and forwards for hours on end, and a couple of them, and the hops sound different to someone walking on two legs. When you're in Australia and you, you hear those noises, when we're out in the bush, you hear it all the time. You just know, yeah, that's a roo. But when you hear something walking on two legs, it, they're worlds apart in their sounds. It's so different that you can pick them up. So, yeah, he got out of the tent, and the first thing he said was, oh, man, something threw a rocket or, some, or, or stick or something at your tent. And I go, well, if you heard it, why didn't you get out? He goes, mate, I just got my truncheon, and I had it all. I had it out, and I'm just, like, hugging it, going, I'm not going out of this tent. So he was freaking out. So... I'm like, oh, well, they're here. So I've researched the area for a while and it kind of settled down a bit. So I thought I'd go somewhere else. I went to a place called Acacia Flat. And Acacia Flat's a campground. It's a pretty big campground, but it's like a five-hour hike to get into Acacia Flat from Govet Sleep. So this is in the Blue Mountains around the Blackheath area. And you're nearly on the other side of the Blue Mountains. And then you go down and then there's all farmland on the other side. I go down there and this is... 2015 Easter. I went there on Easter Saturday to come back out on Easter Monday. But it was raining and by the time I got down there, everything was wet except one pair of clothes. Even my my sleeping bag was half wet. So I thought unless these dry out, I'm only staying here overnight and I've got to get out. My plans are a bit ruined. My bag had a hole in it unfortunately and the water got in. That's what happens sometimes. But I had all I had was a torch, a sound recorder, and a trail cam. So I set the trail cam up. I've gone down there, and probably it's about 7.30 at night. It was pretty dark. Anyway, all I heard was these creatures, or I don't know what they were, but they were running around constantly, and it was just tree breaks. Crack, 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 crack. And I'm thinking, all right, I've put myself in these areas. I've got here at the right time, but I couldn't get out try and see what they were at the tent because it was like raining pretty hard and I was, everything was wet and I've got one pair of clothes on. I had a raincoat, but I'm thinking if I get wet, I'm going to have a bad night, I'm going to be cold and then I've got to hike out tomorrow. So I kind of just stayed in the tent. I had a little tarpaulin over the top, so I did have it open and I was pointing the torch out, but I couldn't see anything and it got pretty foggy as well. Even though it was raining, it always gets foggy there when it's cold. Then probably these things kept Oh, for hours. It was about 7.30 they started. And during the night from about probably 12.30, it started maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. There was this weird screen that was coming up from the valley. I would say at least two to three kilometers. Could be more because the, the noise travels along those those ridges, you know, in the valleys a long way. So what I did was I just sat there and I'm trying to work out maybe it's an owl, like a powerful owl or, or what do you call those other ones, a tawny frog mouth different kinds of owls or barn owl but no it wasn't an owl that i've heard before and it got closer and closer and it got it was get, starting to get really close and it took a couple of hours while everything's still running around breaking branches crack 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 and i'm just like this is awesome but i'm a bit scared at the same time so i'm there by myself there was other people camping in the area but they went right up the other end so they're probably good 
half a kilometer to 800 meters at least away from me. I was the only person there in that part of the uh, of the campground. So it gets pretty early in the morning. It's still breaking branches. Um, I'm still, I didn't go to sleep at all. I was just trying to take as much in. And while I'm doing all this, I'm, I'm learning as I'm going as a researcher. I'm still learning stuff. I'm basically just a person who had an encounter and I'm putting myself out in the bush five hours away to get from help if anything happens. And it's a hard five hours. It's not like walking along a flat road. You're going up and down mountains. Yeah, this scream, it got closer and closer and closer, like every half an hour. And I was just thinking, please don't come near me. Please don't come near me. <laughs> I don't know why I was thinking that. I wanted to have something to happen, but no, nah, this was just more than what I bargained for. It got really close where I opened up the tent to have a bit of a peek through the, the mosquito netting. And there's this big black figure. I couldn't see any features. It was just like a black silhouette. And it was, it would make Shaquille O'Neal look small. It was at least three foot taller than him. And you're probably looking at, in mass, his body mass, about three quarters body mass. So a lot thinner, but still a muscly creature. But I, it was just black, but it was really tall, long legged, long arms. That's about all I could say at his features. And it gave out this big scream. And I freaked, I froze, and I'm just thinking, I'm going to die here. This is where I die. And I'm shaking my head going, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I putting myself in this situation? So anyway, it did a scream. And when it did that scream, all the noises stopped. It just like, bang, that was it. And I was just like, what? And then it just did this big step. And I didn't hear when its foot landed on the grass, because there's all grass area there. And I had my trail camera, and I'm thinking, hey, I've got this on trail camera. This thing's just trod right in front of my trail camera and it's just going to record it. Anyway, so I've got up in the morning. It didn't get light till about 7.30 because it's a pretty deep valley there. Even though the sun will come up 5.30, quarter to 6 in the morning, still took a good hour and a bit for the light to reach the valley. I've got my trail camera. I've opened it up. I've gone through everything because I'm like, oh, I've got some. I've got some. This 100% I've got some. Got nothing. Got nothing. Just photos of just when I had it set to take a photo every 30 seconds or something, or 10 seconds, I think it was, 10 seconds. Got nothing. And I was just like, oh, man. And I had a sound recorder with me, but I wouldn't have been able to get probably anything decent because even though it was standing about three or four meters away from me when it made that scream, I was pretty, like, frozen. I just, it was all new. This is all new to me. These noises and that and things running around in the bushes, like, no, this just doesn't happen. It, you don't get this lucky. Like now, I'd love it. I got the, the gear to to be able to get a thermal and get it on thermal or a sound recorder. Or I got a parabolic dish, but back then I didn't have much gear, and my gear was pretty primitive. It was you know I didn't have a lot of money to buy some good gear. So anyway, I've left there, hiked out, went back there again with a group of guys, but no, it was different. It was just quiet. Nothing happened. So that's what I'm thinking of these creatures that are going from one area to another, like a little tribe, like the Aboriginals would do. They would have their areas where they camp, and then they just keep going around and keep going around and just keep you know, catching wallabies or whatever they catch and eating whatever plants that, they, that you can eat. They know all the plants in Australia, what you can eat and what you can't. So that was a uh, another encounter that was I'll never forget to this day. I've recently, in the last few years, in 2017, I think it was my first time we went to a place called Maramara. And in the indigenous language, Maramara means many fish. And when you go, there is a lot of fish in that little creek. This creek, it's called Maramara Creek. It takes about two and a half hours to hike there. It's a pretty easy hike compared to the Blue Mountains. But when you get to the end of the ridge, then it starts getting a bit tricky because if you've got a heavy backpack, it's not a well-maintained trail, that part. So there's a lot of erosion with the sandstone, so it gets tricky. So we get down to the bottom there, get to the campsite. This is the first time I'm there. I've got a small parabolic dish this time, just a better camera. As soon as the uh, the sun went down, went dark, just wood knocks. There was just weird noises happening, and I'm definitely going to come back to this place again. So we end up leaving there coming back two weeks later and the first person i went with he couldn't make it so it was my wife a fellow uh, researcher and myself so we've hiked in and we used to hike in on another trail which was a lot harder i didn't know about the easy trail back then uh it was a new area 
because most of my research is done in, in the Blue Mountains because it's so close to where I live. So it's easy to get to. So Maramara is about a good probably hour drive north of where I live. There's no one down there. There's no houses there. So if anything happens down there, I can't explain it being human related if there's no one else other than yourself there. You can get in there by boat, but if someone comes in by boat, you'd hear the boat noise. And if the tide goes out, you can't get the boat in because the tide goes right out where it's only like ankle deep water. So no one's getting there. So we've gotten there. We've got the fire going. We're sitting around. And it just happened to be another couple turned up pretty late. And one of the guy, he wanted to do some fishing, being told it's good fishing there. So he come in and we're a bit like, oh, man, there's someone here. We're not going to be able to get what we want. You know, this person's going to make noise. We want to be quiet and try and record as much as we can. But the fishing just wasn't really good that day. So he just come past and said, oh, I'm going to bed and, you know, have a good night. You're probably looking right at quarter past 11 at night. Nothing happened. And I've just said to my friend, sorry about that. Uh, this place was like really rocking two weeks ago. Like we got so many things that happened here. I thought it'd be good. It'd give us some sort of results, you know, uh, anything. But it was really quiet. It was really weird. And that place is really dark, really quiet, really spooky at night. You don't want to go down there by yourself. It's one place I wouldn't go by myself. You've got to go in win- winter time. Most of these places where I go to, I go winter time. It's easy to get to. You don't use a lot of water. Plus, there's no snakes. If you go to this place in summertime, there is brown snakes everywhere. You get bit by a brown snake down there, you're dead. 20 minutes, half an hour, you're dead. That's how quick. It's the second most deadliest snake in the world, and it's prolific down there. There's heaps of them. But people do camp down there, but you've got to be very careful. But I wouldn't. It's just no, summertime to me, you get less results. Wintertime is when I get all my results, all the best results, or while it's raining or just after it's been raining. That's everywhere here. That's what I find. This might, that's just my personal opinion. Other people like say it's better at summertime, but that's just my opinion. So anyway, we're down there at Maramara. I go to put my hand on a zipper on the tent. There's something on the other side of the creek just starts roaring, this massive, and I rec- I've got it recorded on the parabolic dish. But the first one I didn't record, but I had a sound recorder, which I did place on a trail cam which I won't do again because if you place a sound record on a trail cam, you can hear it wind to take a photo every 30 seconds that I had set. But in between the wind, I got the first house that lasted on and off for oh, a good 45 minutes. And what we thought it was, it was trying to find the other members of its little group. And so it's yelling out and making this big, Whoa! but it wasn't a dog. It wasn't a, a dingo either. A dingo's got a different noise and it wasn't a person. And there's no trails over on that side. It's thick bush. And you don't want to go in there because you can get ticks off the ferns. We've, I've gone through there and got ticks myself. So you don't want to get a tick. You can get quite sick. Anyway, so while this is happening, my friend and myself, we've got our parabolic dishes and we're smiling from ear to ear going, yes, 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 we've got something. This is cool. Like no one really had a howl or anything of a yowie. Like in America, you guys have got all the recordings, but in Australia, nothing. So this was pretty much the first howl that lasted for 40, 45 minutes that had ever been recorded in Australia. While that's happening, my wife is freaking out. And until that day, she was pretty much, I think, on the fence of believing about yowies. But when this thing started making a howl on and off, she is shoveling all the wood she can on the fire and in the recordings you can hear the fire flickering you can hear the noise getting louder and louder which i i'm going i'm laughing go be quiet babe be quiet i'm trying to record it and while this is all happening the other guy got out of his tent because he was freaked out too he'd been hunting and he's been in the bush because we did talk to him the next day and he said like i've heard a lot of noises in australia i've never heard that and that's no dog and that's not a person the sound recordings don't do the justice of how loud these uh, howls were. So we're just just shocked of we just happened to get there at the right time. Sometimes it's just coincidence that you just happen to get to a place at a right time. When we go here, we can usually only do one night. It's usually just Saturday night because we all work Monday to Friday. So we can get Saturday night, go home Sunday, and then back to work on Monday. So anyway, he gets out of the tent and he starts putting a fire. He starts lighting the fire and made a big fire because him and his girlfriend, they were freaking out. So these things howling on and off for a good 45 minutes, but 
after about, oh, you're getting about 30 something minutes, 35 minutes, it, it started making its way through the tidal creek. And this tidal creek's really cold in wintertime. This was probably a minus two or minus three degrees. Um, it's pretty cold here for Australia. We don't get really minus conditions unless you're down in the southern highlands when it's snowing. And then you probably get your minus 20 or 30 or something. But uh, here, minus two or three is pretty cold when you're camping if you haven't got the right gear because we all had thermals on and, and jumpers and beanies and all that. So it's gone through the creek. And you don't want to go for this creek when it's this time of the year because the next day I, I actually had gone through to get my sound recorder and my, and my trail cam and I just had bare feet because that's how low the, the, the creek gets. So it was pretty much ankle deep and I swear I got frostbite on my feet. That's how cold the water was. So no one's walking through that water. It would be deeper than your head anyway. It'd be at least probably seven or eight foot deep there. So the creature's going through. So it's a big creature because you could hear it swashing through the water. And then it, what it did, it come across, you could hear it going through the grass there. There's tall grass that's probably about oh, three quarters as tall as what I am. I'm about six foot. And so the other guy, his name's Kurt. He puts the torch on and he's pointing in the bush. So me and my research partner, would put our torches on which are a lot stronger um he's looking back at us because he's going well they can hear what i can hear so we got the torches out and then it goes running through the bush and then up the ridge and then just takes off and we're just like oh my god and then like we've got to come back here again so that guy kurt has become a good friend and we've been going back to maramara on a few occasions over the next couple of years so we've gone back down there I think it was during when COVID started in 2020. It hit Australia in March in 2020. So we've gone down there when we were able, I think it was maybe, I think it was maybe August of 2020. We couldn't camp at the Maramara campground. We had to go to another one called the Orchard Campground, which is two kilometers away because people had already booked the campground and they were only allowing two tent spaces and a maximum, I think, of four people for each tent space. But no one turned up. Because we went from the, uh, the the orchard campground and we hiked to two kilometres, which is a flat little dirt road, and we went back there. But we camped, and or pretty much stopped with my. I've got a professional parabolic dish. I've got a thermal monocular now, but I didn't have it then. It was still coming up from Victoria, which is the next state down from where I live in New South Wales. Anyway, so we're there with the parabolic and we're at this little tidal creek it's a freshwater creek that comes in and then the actual camp again is probably another 200 meters further so i said to kurt we'll go we'll stop here because if we go over the creek then when if the tide comes in it, it, we're going to get trapped so we'll just stay this side so we can go back to our campsite we can start hearing these noises and i've got the parabolic dish on and i've got the headphones that are noise cancelling so i can't hear anything else but what's coming through the dish but i am taking the headphones off to go did you hear that did you hear that I did pick up something like it had just walked through the little freshwater creek and you can hear the droplets of water coming off, whatever it was, and dropping into the actual creek. Then you can hear some movement. And I know there's roos, kangaroos down there, and they get pretty big, but they didn't sound like roos to me. Just something was actually uh, ripping grass out of the ground. And then I saw red eye shine and I've never seen red eye shine. I've never seen anything eye shine from a yowie in my life and that was the first time. And I said, I've seen red eye shine. And then I said, it's coming over to the other side of the, the, the creek. And the creek is probably a good five meters. It's pitch black. We haven't got torches on. We're doing everything in the dark. That's what we do. Everything's in the dark. So, you know, we're going to get as much results as we can. So on the other side of the creek, it's pulling grass out. And you can hear the dirt coming off all the roots from the grass. And it chucks it all in the creek. And we're like, oh, it's chucking stuff at us. It's throwing dirt at us. And we're like, all right, just stay here. Stay still. Stay calm. Then it runs over to the main creek, Maramara Creek, so it chucks a big rock in. And it hear the, you know, the noise. And we're like, it's just throwing a rock in the creek. And then we could hear noise. And we just said on that recording, it sounds like a female monkey. We just, I don't know what a female monkey is, but we just said, a female, it sounds like monkey girl. It's, it's like this weird noise. We're just shaking hands like, gee, this is awesome. There's so much happening. There's wood knocks. You get tree backs. I can hear a tree getting ripped apart. I had that on a recording. And then we just kept on hearing rocks getting thrown in the creek. And this all happened for about oh, 25 minutes to half an hour. And then it all settled down. And then I said, oh, I think we should go. We'll go back to the orchard campground. And we'll, it's getting pretty late. Anyway, so we went back and sat down and sat around the fire, made a fire and just talked about what happened. And we we're really excited. 
We went back there again. Fortunately, not much happened the last time. Uh, but I did get one weird. It was like a different howl, or can't say howl. I don't know what the yeah, what noise a yell would make. A scream, yell, howl. Or I'm not sure what what kind of noise it would make. But what I mean is to describe it. Like I just say howl because that's what it just sounded like to me. But this one was weird. It was different. And I've actually had it sent to um, someone that was with the Olympic project um, in America, and uh, she just said, "Yeah, it's it was similar to some of the ones that were recorded in over in the states." So that's two weird howls I've got from that area of uh, tree breaks, wood knocks. I've recorded something walking through the water. I've had multiple things happen there. It does feature in the. Uh, track search for Australia's Bigfoot and a rock got thrown at one of the trees while we're there in the darkness on a trail and the tree fell over about three meters in front of us and we actually found like a den in that kind of area we found a a, a tree that had been broken it was like a and it was just placed on top of the stump like a t-shape and while we're there filming for track uh, Tiller had taken a few photos, but we didn't know there's this big eye shine in the in the darkness looking at us at about eight foot in the air, and there's no branch there for like an owl to perch on. So I don't know, and there was really no possums in that area. Very, I very rarely see a possum in that area. There's no trees. There's a lot of pine trees, and the possums like the native gum trees because they they open up and the, the possums can can go in there and live. So that's been an area that's been probably my best area that I'll fall back on to go and research when everywhere else is quiet because just lately in the Blue Mountains, we had bushfires before the COVID broke in 2019, 2020. That's our summertime and you could see the fires, the bushfires from space probably killed a couple of million animals. It wiped out hundreds of houses, took lives. It was the worst bushfires in Australia's history. The impact is still there till today. You go to places where it just looks like you're going driving through hell. There's just charcoal ground. It's, everything's grey. There's no bushes. It's just tree stumps. It's like someone's just put all these tree stumps in. They're all black, charcoaled everywhere. It's unbelievable how much damage was done by them bushfires. And then we had floods, and then we had COVID. So there was all these things that impacted the bush that made me go and research other areas while my Blue Mountains, which I call it, heals itself, which is currently doing now. It, the Australian bush does regenerate really quickly, but when it, everything gets burnt to the ground, it takes a long time. It'd probably be a good 10 years before it's back to anywhere near what it was like before we researched there. Trying to think of another place, I went to a place called the Wadigans, and the Wadigans is up near Cessnock, which is about two and a half hours north of Sydney. So I went with the same research friend, Adam, who I researched uh, at Maramara with. He said, come up to, he lived up that area. So I decided to go and research his area. We got to, we can only find, uh, uh, it's called the Pines Campground. There's a lot of pine trees there. A lot of people ride motorbikes during the day, but at nighttime it gets quiet. But it got pretty busy, the campground. So we said, look, we've got to walk away from this campground to try and get any sort of uh, result. So we've walked over the ridge gone to the other side and there's like a four-wheel drive track there we could have got in there with my friend's four-wheel drive but he did not bring it that day we brought uh, uh, just a normal sedan so that's why we didn't get in there so we've walked down here and we've gone there in the afternoon it's about 1 o'clock and i'm saying i've got to go and find where everything's green if you go to areas where it's like desolate and it's really dry you're not going to get anything there nothing's going to live where there's nothing to eat so i thought i'm going to go down to this creek I'm going to check down there and see what's down there. So he said, I'll stay up the top and I'll just check out things here. And you go down and if anything happens, call me. We've got little walkie talkies and you can come down. All right. So I'll get down to the bottom after spent. It probably took me half an hour to get down there. There's a lot of reeds and that and vines and they're all got hooks on them. So you're forever trying to take them out of your clothes. And by the time you get back, your clothes are all ripped. So I'm, I'm always forever changing clothes all the time because of, the amount of uh, bush bashing I do and the, and the damage happens to the clothes. So I've got down to the bottom and I'm looking around. I'm saying, oh, it's pretty green down here. But it's a nice area. You know, something, a substantial sized animal could live. There's a few different little smaller animals around here. 
birds. There's a lot of little ferns, and I know some sort of ferns or some sort of small plants, animals do dig them up to eat the roots because they're sweet, and there's water in the roots down the, in the plants. And then something starts growling at me, and I'm like, on the microphone, on a walkie-talkie, and say, Adam, uh, someone's just growled at me. He's going, what do you mean? He goes, what? I go, yeah, something growled at me. Not like a dog, but a weird kind of a weird growl. I don't know what it is. I can't see nothing. And then it just takes off and goes up the ridge. And I go, well, it's coming up to you now. And he's going, what? And he goes, oh, I can hear it. So I'm down there in the creek, and the ridge is probably a good 150, 200 meters up. So I can hear something running from my left to the right, and then something chasing it. And that was Adam. And I'm like, are you chasing it? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, but the weird thing is, it's like predator. You can see it. Like something's running there, but you can see all the leaves flicking up, but I can't see it. I'm just going, what? Anyway, I've walked back up. I thought, I'll come back up. Maybe it might do a double take and try and go around you and come back. Anyway, so he's gone. I lost it. I lost it. So what it did, it kind of went from my left to my right, but then it did like a D shape and did like a half circle and come back to where it originally was. And I've come up the ridge and it was probably about oh, 50 or 60 meters to my left. And I'm kind of looking around and going, gee, there's, there's a lot of sand there, but it looked like a big foot had been in there, but I couldn't see any definition, but it was like a big foot. So I've looked to my left and you know, when you see those athletes, the walkers, and they do the 42K marathon walk and they in the Olympics, and you don't think they're really going fast until you see someone running ne- next to them, and they're actually like someone's got a sprint to keep up with them. That's how this creature was doing. I seen it to my left. It was like Paddy, the one from the Patterson Gimlin film in uh, Bluff Creek. It was really thick like that, pretty much the same shape, and it was black, jet black, but it was solid. Like it was big, solid creature, but it wasn't really tall. It was probably six foot two or three, probably maybe even six foot one. It wasn't any smaller or taller than about six, three. I've got a good look at it and I'm going on a walkie talkie, Adam, 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 come back, come back. It's over here. So he comes running back. He's probably gone a couple hundred meters. I'm going, it's in the bush. It's in the bush. Uh, But as it walked down, when I first saw it, I could only see it for glimpses because there was big gum trees there that were pretty much, you'd have to have three or four people hold hands to stand around the base of them. They're pretty big. Every second stride, I would see it. But it, I'd have to run to keep up with it. And it went down into the bush. I'm going, quick, quick, come over. So we've gone down to chase it. And as it's gone down, we've gone down, just the vines got worse and worse and worse. And then we just couldn't get through. But we could hear it bashing its way through the bush. And it must have went down to the creek and then took off. And we tried to look for hares and, and anything that we could find, but we couldn't see anything. So we thought, we'll come back here nighttime and see what we can get. So we basically just had parabolic dish each, a cheap one, the little black plastic one with a little clear dish, sorry. Uh, we had cameras and a tor- and head torches. So we're walking around, but we were up the top of the ridge. We thought, if we can't get down to the bottom, I said, it's too hard in the dark. We'll just walk around this trail and we'll see what we can find. So it got a bit windy, so you couldn't hear too much, but we're standing up on the, on the top of the ridge and then something come charging into the bush and it's like it got to the tree line and just stopped. It would come up from behind us. So we've just turned around thinking something's just going to like fly out of the bush. And I'm thinking it's just going to be a big gray roo or something because they just take off and run straight. And you don't want to get a big kangaroo to hit you because they're like seven foot tall and they're like, they're, they're muscly and they, they could do some damage if they grab hold of you and scratch you with their, with their feet. They've got really sharp nails. But no, nothing. It just stopped. This thing just stopped in the bush and we're like, where is it? So there's nothing there. So we kind of walked up to the bush and we kind of, Went to that tree line and we're looking through and there's nothing here, mate. I go, you heard something walk up, didn't you? Adam goes, yeah, something definitely charged its way up here. It wasn't wind, it was something charging through the bush. So we don't know what that was till this day. I've had another, we actually got this one on film. It wasn't myself. It was actually what I did. I used to run a Facebook group called Blue Mountains Yowie Research, which um, I don't run anymore. I've kind of taken a step back and just post all my stuff on um, my YouTube channel, uh, Australian Yowie. So that's all I do is post stuff on that YouTube channel. So we've gone up to a place called the Barrington Tops. It took us about six hours, five to six hours to drive there from Sydney, north of Sydney. Uh, so it was myself, my wife, David Reed, and then another group, three girls come along, or ladies, which I'd say, and Johnny. Katie and Ren. So we met them for the first time, but we'd been talking yowies and everything on Facebook for a while. We thought we'd 
walk around there during the night and look the night times there that was minus seven so not many creatures are walking around there at night in minus seven so when you walk away from the fire it gets pretty cold so we're rugged up we did record something running away from us the night before down this trail but it could have been something small like a wombat or, a, or even a possum i can't really say that's could be yeah we related at all but it was just something that was it it's interesting. It's better have something move around you than nothing. The next night, we stayed there for two nights. The next night, we thought we'll go along the road and just walk along the road and see what's there in the bush. So as we're walking along, my wife and myself would walked a bit further away from the group. They'd stopped to check something out. And I, I heard a wood knock. I recorded a wood knock. I said to my wife, did you hear that? She says, yeah, yeah. I said, I've, got a, I've recorded that. So the, we waited there and the other four come up. And we're just looking around and we're walking up the road and it's getting a bit steep. And I'm like, oh, let's just go back down. This is, we'll just try and see what we can get down the bottom there. And as we're walking down, I thought I saw something move in the bush. And I'm like, did something move there? Or was it just one of your, the shadows from the torch? So anyway, we kept going and I got to an area where I said, I can get into the bush here because it's pretty thick. And it's the side of the, the road's kind of dug into the side of the ridge and the ridge is pretty high. And there's a lot of vines, and I thought, this area I can get in. So I thought, I'll just go in. I've got a night vision, and I've got the IR light on the top of my camera, so I can video, and it's crystal clear, 4K, but it's just everything's in green. So I'm videotaping, and I've got my little parabolic dish, and I'm looking more just to the left a little bit, but pretty much straight and concentrating on straight and to my right. I'm only looking there because all the rest of them are to my left, and they're, they're pointing torches into the bush and i'm thinking well there's nothing will be there to my left because they're there pointing torches so i might as well just concentrate on here but there was something there to my left and i have filmed there a little bit but i didn't capture anything but we did not notice at the time but a couple of weeks later i went to do a uh a talk about my glenbrook sighting up a place called nana glen which is a bit further up than gloucester probably another hour or two north of gloucester which is where the Barrington Tops is, where we filmed this. Katie, who filmed it, come up to me and uh, said, and Dave Reed was there. My wife said, look, this is, you remember the, the Barrington Tops when you're in the bush, Dan? He goes, look at this. And you could see this figure and it gets up and turns around and you can see like its arms, its legs, and then like its hand and its like shoulder. You can see it moving in the bush. And if anyone said, look, that could, could be just a big long snake, I don't know what snakes hang around in minus seven conditions. Surely wasn't a roo. A kangaroo doesn't move like that. They just get up and hop. They don't walk on two legs like bipedal. There's nothing else it could be. There was not another person there. It's just thick bush there and there was only us there. No one else goes there winter time. It's very popular in the summer, but not in winter. That video footage is actually in the upcoming Tracking the Law documentary. So if you want to see that footage, watch Tracking the Law. We went to a place called Woodford in the Blue Mountains with my Blue Mountains Yarrow Research Group. There was a few people that had just been uh, joining the group at the time. And I just said, look, this have a meetup and everyone can tell their stories. So a couple of ladies turned up. Uh, one of my friends came who doesn't believe in them, but he just wanted to come along and hear people talk. Uh, Adam was there. This was 2017, I believe. So we're at Woodford. We thought we'd just, it's an easy, we'll go to an easy place, not have to hike. Not everyone's really, really fit. So we get down there. You can drive your car to the campsite called Murphy's Glen, park your car. And then basically when you park your car, you can put set your tent straight up there. So we've had a bit of a talk and got everything set up. Set a big tarpaulin because it looked like it might rain a bit later on. It does rain a fair bit in the Blue Mountains. It's just what mountains are like. Everywhere around the world, places rain because of the because of the mountainous areas. So we've got in. We've hiked to Glenbrook Creek, and that runs all the way along the Blue Mountains up to Glenbrook, and then goes out to the Nepean River. We've gone down there, and we thought. I said, I've got a sound recorder, and I've got a trail cam. We'll set one up here on this little creek. It's all sand, and we'll set it up there. We'll try and not walk on the sand that much so if anything does walk on there it's not our footsteps it's actually something that we're looking for which is the yowie or a small junjity so we set up everything up we go back to the campsite and everyone tells their stories and 
some people having a couple of beers, just enjoying the night. And there's possums around and we're filming the possums and having a good time. So I wake up in the morning. I get up in the morning, walk down in drizzling rain. So I just take clothes that I've been wearing the day before. So my new clothes don't get wet. Rather get old clothes that are, that are dirty, getting wet. So I go down to 20 minutes to the, the, the creek. I got to the creek. There's nothing much there. Get the trail camera, have a look. There's not much on it. Get the sound recorder, turn it off, walk away. When I get back home, I get the sound recorder. And what I do is I go through the sound recordings a couple of times. And the only thing that I picked up was as I was walking and I was, you could hear me coming in towards the sound recorder. And I got my little camera. I had a little camera at the time and I was talking and just telling people about the area that I was in and what I've set up and for my YouTube channel. And as I'm walking in, you could hear, oh, I didn't hear it, but probably about 20 seconds before I actually got there, two rocks clack, clack, clack. Now, I'm not sure what did it, but I know there was no one else down there. There's only one trail to get in and out there. It's drizzling rain. It's about six o'clock in the morning. It's cold. I don't know anyone that's going to hide down there just to say I'm going to going to do two rock clacks to freak someone out. That just doesn't happen. All I can put it down is that these creatures use rock clacks or wood knocks maybe as a sign that like humans are coming. So I was the threat and we set up some gear and I don't know if they know, they're sure, 100% sure they don't know what a sound recorder or, or a trial camera is, but they give off electrical like signatures so that there must be something that they just don't like about them so they stay away from the trail cameras that's why you never get them on there but the sound recorders are different i've had them walking up to sound recorders and walking around at a place called coxus river which is i was doing the k to k which is 55k hike and it's all hard and you've got to filter water as you're going and you just it was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life but if you look at the map where it looked like bluff creek and basically we set stuff up there about 9 30 10 o'clock at night because we went to bed straight away because we're so tired and you can hear something walking up in the sand and walking around the sound recorder and after a minute or so walk away so there that's another weird story that i can't explain but you've got to be put yourself in the right place to be able to get these findings and these recordings most of my stuff is recorded on these sound recorders and then when i pick these things up and i get something weird that i can't explain it's not a kangaroo, it's not a wombat, it's not any creature that I know that should be you know, into science, then I'll go and research these areas. So these are just some of the uh, things that have happened to me while I've been on my journey since 2005, and it's not going to stop until I leave this earth. So I'm going to keep trying to find out what this creature exactly is. So I hope you've enjoyed my talk today. Um, I've pretty much told as much as I could and explained it as best I could. So Anyone wants to see what I've been doing in the past years, just look up Australian Yowie in the um, YouTube and you could see these places. One of them, the Maramara one, it's got all the sound recordings from that night on it. So if anyone's interested, please look up my channel, watch Tracking the Law, the latest documentary that I'm involved in. And I will say one thing, I thought Track the Search for Australia's Bigfoot was the best documentary I've seen, but this one blows it out of the park. It's unbelievable. You have to watch this documentary, not just because I'm in it and it's a friend who made it. It is made that well. You would want to watch it more than once. Anyway, I'll end my talk there, and it's been great having been on this show, and hopefully in the future I can be on there again. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the bow And the five string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking their bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it 
And I hear the front porch picking down on rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Sweet tea, got the sound. 